on the new link. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and now I'm going to post it on the. And we'll need to tweet it out again, I think. Yep. Technical issue. This is now the correct link. Hey, there we go. Okay, so I've put it on the. Okay, and I'll just put it in the chat window here as well. Yeah, so that's working now. All right, so. Okay, all right, we've got people now coming into the new one. Right. Should we just tell them we'll get started in just a couple of minutes? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, we'll just be waiting for people to come in. As soon as, um, yeah, as soon as I've got my introduction out of the way, I'll email all the people the new link. We'll go from there. So, educational small talk. <laughs> All right. Looks like we got some people. You sure okay. there's all of us? <laughs> oh, there we are. They're all coming in. That's all right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. At least. I reckon your dog's got more fans than all of us. All of us. Oh, there we are. They're all coming in. That's all right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. At least. All right, well, let's start then, I guess, eh? Let's do it. As we wait for things to happen. So welcome to, what are we calling it? Teach Me New Futures. Um, I'm currently on the lands of the Wurundjeri people rep and uh, recognize elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, everyone else is in different places to me, though. So today I'll just share my screen in so you can see some core information you might need to know. So you know how all this works. And then we'll crack on with the presentations. He says surreptitiously checking the stream. All right, so this is our event, uh, Teach Me New Futures, on today at 8 p.m. That is the second online Teach Meet we've had so far. This is Teach Meet 2. You can use that hashtag if you like. So in case you haven't been to one before, Teach Meet is basically short presentations. Everyone speaks for the same length of time, which here is five minutes. Uh, it's sector blind and inclusive as we can be. Normally we do this face to face. So everyone has their presentation. And then afterwards we all go out and eat dinner together and sort of get to know each other and those sort of things. So in the absence of that, me and Josh will be trying to kind of kill dead air in between presentations and uh, pass on any questions that you might have for the presenters or for anyone even in the chat, I guess. Uh, if you're on social media, our two hashtags are hashtag TM2 and hashtag TMMEL, which is Teach Meet Mel. And of course, you're on YouTube at the moment, and so post any questions, ideas, or thoughts you have in there. Uh, these are all the people that are here. You might want to pause at this moment and introduce yourself to the chat, to the group. Obviously, if this was in person, you'd just be talking to people, but in the absence of that, 
try as best as you can to engage with someone else in the chat. Uh, this has come out pretty poor quality, um, but there's just a academic in the room who's basically just observing and participating as an observer. Uh, if you have any questions, there's details there. Uh, she is from the University of Dublin, and she's just basically keeping abreast of uh, the Teach Me movement and how it works. I'll pause for a moment here, so you've got a second to sort of see who's speaking and what their topics are roughly, and I'll try not to talk over an entirely text slide. All right, so that hopefully gives you a bit of a enough of an idea of what's going on tonight so you can get a picture of what's happening. And when we come back to my screen, our first presenter is Yes or Die. So whenever you are ready, Yes or you can start us off. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Yasuday Silva Kumaran. And um, this evening, I just wanted to share, um, I guess, what I'm thinking about in terms of my role supporting teachers in teacher professional learning, um, and especially beginning teachers. At the moment, I have a group of 11 uh, new teachers at our school. And while all of this is going on in terms of new futures and working out new ways of teaching and learning, um, I think it might be far from some people's minds, but to remember that the teaching standards can offer us um, a way to benchmark what we're trying to do and capture that evidence as well. So this idea of, yes, it's same, same, but different in terms of the kinds of evidence, there's a lot of innovation going on at the moment. And in New South Wales, this is definitely what we work with, the New South Wales um, copy of the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers. And I just wanted to share with you, um, I guess, a reflection in terms of running my first online induction meeting last Thursday. And I thought it was the best meeting that we'd ever had. And somehow in that online space where um, all of our new teachers have been given a task um, on student reflection and to trial it in their classes from the week before, came back and um, being able to share screens and having a task that they were willing to share and give each other feedback on, I found was just, um, you know, really, really different to the way that we'd had in-person induction meetings. So I think, you know, in terms of professional learning as well, this idea of new futures is one that is quite exciting and to be able to explore the ways that online mediums can actually facilitate things like this one, having a teach meet online, and thank you to the organisers for this evening, but to look at how we can capture that evidence. Now, another thing that I wanted to share as well is it looks like a very simple scaffold. Um, actually, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but basically um, there's a focus on the verbs at the different levels of the Australian proficient professional standards for teachers. Um, it's an activity that I ran with our mentor team last year where to really look at what the standards mean and what it means for us in setting goals about our practice was going through and actually um, printing off these fantastic resources that are from the actual website. Um, they've got them for each level from graduates uh, high, graduate proficient, highly accomplished and lead and taking time with the teams um, that you work with to actually see where it is that people fit in terms of their practice. Um, and I think this is an absolute golden opportunity to stop, think about what we're doing, capture that evidence um, and be able to see where people's practice aligns um, in a coaching and mentoring sense as well. So even for me personally, at the moment um, in New South Wales, uh, I am looking at the highest standards. I know that that's done differently throughout Australia and I guess even parts of the world. I know we've got some international people joining us tonight, which is great and really exciting. But to look at how is it that we can think about the ways that we do things in professional learning, set our goals, which might be the same, but that have obviously been um, changed in this current pandemic that we find ourselves in and how even participating in forums like this, um, you know, it's the same in terms of professional networks and standard six that refers to that in the Australian standards um, and also going on to thinking about broadly um, standard seven and engaging with community, but really thinking about where it is that that fits. So basically, I just wanted to say, you know, it's an amazing profession that we're in, that we're being able to share ideas and get energy from each other and uh, share strategies on how this is and to be able to just make sure that we stop um, and reflect against whatever standards we might be working in 
um, and using that as a way to be able to model and lead our colleagues um, in this time of change. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where Stephen is to say thanks, but well done. Appreciate it. <laughs> There's no applause or, uh, or anything like that at this point. So you kind of just have to assume you've done a great job. I did see a virtual applause, actually. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I think usually as teachers, you're always waiting for like a smile or a laugh from a kid or something like that. Well, you're not getting any of that, I guess, from here. But uh, maybe maybe we'll get some sort of applause in the chat or something like that to make it look like we're doing a good job. <laughs> but great job. Thank you. Thank you. I ask yesterday, how, how long have you been teaching for? Uh, this is my 10th year of uh, teaching. And um, I've been a formal mentor now for almost seven of those years. Cool. Yeah, I always find it interesting to sort of be the the first face that newbies see, and you realise just how far how far you've come. Yeah, um, I, it's it's interesting being on the other side now, like helping coordinate that, and yeah, working with great teams to be able to do it. Beautiful. All right, next up is Peter Hutton with the best shirt in the chat. Peter, when you're ready. No worries. So uh, I'll um, jump in. Yesterday, let me give you a round of applause and everybody else at home can give uh, you a round of applause as well. As well. Um, my connectivity says that it's non-optimal at the moment, so uh, I'm hoping somebody waves profusely if you can't understand a word that I'm saying. Um, my name's Peter Hutton. I'm the director and one of the co- or the co-founder of Future Schools Alliance. Uh, we work with 50 uh, or more than 50 schools around Australia and New Zealand, including some of the most innovative schools in the country. Uh, prior to that, um, I was principal at Templestowe College, um, which we, we did some interesting things there. At the moment, and the thing that I'd like to talk to you about today is I've started a campaign, uh, hashtag no ATAR 2020. Um, I'll put the cards on the table. I've never been a fan of the ATAR. Um, primarily, I'm not against assessment, um, but I am against a, a system that ranks students against one another. And I think particularly given the circumstances that we're in uh, at the moment, the inequity uh, and the level of pressure that it's placing on students is, is just insane. Um, and, and I think there are some far more humane uh, ways that we can deal with our senior students. Um, ATAR has in fact been in operation for more than 10 years. And I guess the question I would have is, if it's such a great system, uh, why haven't other countries in the world picked it up? Because we are the only country on earth that directly ranks students against one another. And I guess my primary concern at this particular time is that for every student who is uh, disadvantaged, one student uh, that goes up means that another student goes down in the rankings. And for whatever reason, our education ministers uh, and politicians seem hell-bent on keeping uh, a system that even prior to the pandemic was totally inequitable. Um, I guess the, the thing that I would point out is the OECD, you might be unaware that the Aust Australia is actually the wealthiest country, or certainly pre this, uh, was the wealthiest country in the world as, men as measured by uh, median wealth. And, uh, and yet out of the 38 OECD countries uh, that were assessed for this, we were the 30th worst in terms of equity, and that was pre-pandemic. So if you take those two factors into account, the fact that we were already inequitable and we were the only country in the world that ranks students, and we have a, uh, a population that is hugely diversely spread, uh, I think that this year, is, is just extraordinarily bad for young people. Uh, many students came into the year uh, on the back of, of fires, flood, drought. Uh, they were extremely uh, significantly impacted by those experiences, uh, some more so than others. But again, the very ones that are going to be impacted by the current uh, COVID uh, situation, those that are rural and remote, are the same ones that came in being hugely affected at, as uh, as was the case. The, the other crazy thing from my perspective is that 
because the, uh, the world economy is going to be incredibly suppressed um, next year, there's in fact going to be a huge number of, stu uh, of, of international students who are not coming to, uh, to Australia, certainly next year. And so the universities actually have capacity combined with the fact that uh, they've now developed huge online, well, hopefully over the next uh, six months, they will have developed huge online capacity. There's no reason why we couldn't in fact offer uh, tertiary education to any Australian who was suitably qualified, particularly those who are senior students in 2020. So, you know, people that have concerns about drops in standards, the fact that somebody starts a university degree doesn't mean that they qualify and are then going to build the bridge that we all crash on. Uh, the reality is starting a degree gives uh, young people the opportunity of experiencing potentially, for those that go, university life. Uh, and when we're throwing uh, $300 billion, $300 billion in surplus around, I don't think it would be too much for the government to cut these kids a break, give them a free kick into university and, and allow them that experience. Thanks very much for your time, guys. All right, beautiful. Nicely done. Um, I guess this is probably a bit of a too, too difficult question to throw out um, what alternative you might suggest on short notice, but are you more or less just saying that that's a broken system or do you have an alternative in mind? Maybe he's gone. <coughs> All righty, let's move along. Lauren, if you're ready to go, by all means, jump in. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Lauren Sayer. I'm an educator here in Melbourne. Um, and, yes, as you got in the nine seconds, this is Bowie Puppy who will steal the show a lot more than me. And if you've got any tips on ways to teach him, I'm always open to them. I want to talk tonight about how I think this is a golden opportunity for us to really leapfrog in innovation through some collaboration and just share one collaboration program that we've started at my school and actually opened the door to getting some more collaboration. So I'll put in the chat, um, we created a guide for students. Now we just created this guide for everyone um, and it was just for kids and it was how do you level up in this? So just a little handbook of learning online. And we looked at, well, how do you get yourself set up in your space? How do you make a, how do you be a video class superstar? Why PJs are not fashionable online classware, um, although that is controversial. Um, how to be super productive, and really looking at looking at different ways to note take and look at things. And finally, and I think most importantly, some tips on for our students how to stay chill, how to do some mindfulness and level up their learning in those guys. So we created that really with the idea that it was a tool to go out for any student, not just ours, um, to start to grow and learn. And we put it up under Creative Commons um, and also we've put it up in conjunction with ABC um, as well. And what we're wanting to do now is actually crowdsource the next sets of guides. I'm seeing so many different resources and we're all creating our own things. So we thought we'd create a little toolkit um, so that we can create a level up guide for teachers and a level up guide for parents, which I think is just something really important. So there's the, um, I've put in the chat, the create guide and the student guide, but really I think the big thing I'm just wanting to talk about is we had a crack at it and we are by no means the experts in this. And I think that online now we've got 86 people. If we all had a crack at writing something for our parents and our teachers, what would we put together? And the idea really is that it is a totally creative commons. So you can download it, remix it. So we've put a creator's toolkit and a submission there. And I just really hope that we can get together um, and create a level up guide for our parents and our students because I think when we've done it with our students so far, they've been loving to use it. And again, it was just a group of about five of us at the moment 
Um, and I think, what if we had 86 of us? So that's all I really have to say. Um, bye from myself and bye from Bowie. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, so how, if I were to open the handbook right now and I yeah. had some stuff I wanted to copy in, how would I, how would I go about it? How hard is it for me to work out? Uh, all you have to do is submit basically your paragraph of what it is you have to do, any images, and then one of the things that I think I struggle with in all of this that I'm not good at is getting it format so it looks like this amazing toolkit. So the idea was it's just a simple form that you submit and then we, we actually put it into some desktop publishing and get someone to actually publish it up so that it's a kit for everybody. Um, and that was the really idea. The big thing is that if we can crowdsource these two things, what we're wanting to do is start to crowdsource, um, and I've seen a few people um, say it in there, we're all doing this work, is actually start to crowdsource some curriculum. And we're looking at, at the moment, setting up a global curriculum design challenge where we start to submit curriculum and work out, well, how can we answer these great questions or how do we get 80 people to design those math things? Because I'm just seeing everybody at the moment in the community working so ridiculously hard for them and then they share it and it's not quite right for you so then you have to repurpose it but what if we actually all sat together and said well these are our needs and run through an agile design process to get that done yeah beautiful um i'll put the um i'll put the link to that in the description of the stream as well because obviously the chat's going pretty quickly it might be tricky to find yeah um, so I'll do that in a moment. Um, and then I think when um, when uh, Matthew comes up, he's got a, a similar attempt from Digital Learning Technologies Victoria, DLTV, um, which is another place that you can share kind of already existing mm -hmm. resources, maybe not curriculum resources, but little tools you can use. Uh, next up, we've got Kelly talking about te how teaching online is seriously intense. I feel like you missed a pun opportunity there, Kelly, but... I don't know. Well, I mean, that's what this week is like, right? It's too intense for anyone to be on their best game. I think it's just... That was that was where we're at. Um, so, so thanks. Um, I am going to try and share my screen just briefly to get the tweet up that I wanted to talk about from last week. So... Um, bear with me while I pop that up, and if it doesn't work, um, I'll knock it off. But um, so we should see a little tweet screen there. And I just wanted to run through this very quickly and then riff on it with the four ideas, um, which is what I promised. So Teach Meet One, the one thing I'd share is that digital teaching elements take approximately two times as long to produce. And I was being generous here so that I didn't frighten too many people because this was a week ago. Um, but really, sometimes it can be 10 times as long, right? So I was saying you do the maths. You have to fight now to halve your contact hours as soon as possible or pay the price big time down the road. And if anyone's kind of imagining like a project planner or something, you imagine your, your Trello or your Monday or whatever it is that you do your design and planning and you think, I teach this much five days a week and I do this much overtime every night. If that doubles, it, it doesn't fit. It's not going to fit in for anyone and um, we'll all be working big time over time and running out of time. So the barrier that most teachers will inevitably encounter, and I did as well, is if I halve my contact hours, how will I fit in all of that essential talking that I used to do in front of the class? And the answer is hard to swallow and it's going to prompt the most profound change in your pedagogy, but a lot of that talking was not essential. A lot of kids were never listening. It was not well differentiated and I'm talking on behalf of myself here too. And that's why they won't watch your teaching videos and why they won't watch your mini lectures. And they just still don't want to know or hear from you and now they don't have to. And that sounds really mean and I am very sorry. And I don't mean that teachers don't make a difference. It's just that our board work often isn't very good and replicating it online makes it double not good. And I'm speaking from experience because I used to think I was very captivating. And in real life, I think I, can be, but online it doesn't translate. Um, that's why digital will take you so long. You're dismantling and rebuilding your pedagogy from scratch and it's soul searching time. So I really did just want to be able to share that before I went on to say, look, there are four things that I think are going to um, really be a confronting moment for everyone out there. 
And I'm really talking in terms of emotions, not practical stuff. You know, there are going to be plenty of people out there with tips about the practical tools to use, and I can talk about that any time. But it's the emotional load that is going to take everyone by surprise because everyone's worked hard before for a sprint, but, um, like, this is going to be huge. So if you can't cover the same amount of content, all of a sudden you are very confronted by the question of whether everything you were any that ever covering was important whether you could have been cutting it in half this whole time and if so which half to choose and what's actually most relevant to your subject and your discipline and you have to think you know if my discipline is going to be cut in half to go online hopefully just for the next six months right think dystopian future um which part of my discipline do i want to save for future generations is what that question comes down to so it's massive um, a second thing that you have to confront is, as I said in the tweet, you, you do talk too much, probably. Everyone in, I do, I do. Stephen jokes about academics talking doubly too much and it's terrible. So everyone has to confront that ego problem that you probably talk too much, that you probably took up too much space in your classroom um, and then you have to deal with the emotional baggage that goes along with doubting your philosophies and your practices around that. So that's tough. Um, the analytics don't lie. So this is the third thing that's very confronting. I saw a tweet today, um, Megan Towns was saying, yay, the analytics feature is just turned on for teams. You can just go in now and see exactly what it is that your students are engaging with, you get data in real time. And on one hand, that's fantastic. Analytics are completely powerful, awesome, transformational. And one of the ways that they'll transform you is by completely breaking you down with the evidence that your students don't watch your stuff or read your stuff or download your stuff. So this will happen to me at university and this is a common experience. You've got a unit with 80 students, 150, 300 students, whatever. You do a lecture, you put it online, half show up the first week and then that number dwindles off throughout the semester. You check the learning analytics to say, oh, well, if they're at home, maybe they're watching it and maybe that number even increases as more of them stay home. No five watched it in week one, four watch week two, three. It's, it's pathetic. And I know the numbers might be a little bit better in secondary, but I'm not super hopeful about it. So be prepared for that crush. And then the very last thing is because we've um, put learning in the home, um, and this has happened at universities as well, we've got so many external students, we have to perpetually be imagining them doing their work in their homes, not in a classroom. And that means that anyone in that space effectively has an eye on your work which means that now you effectively have a public audience for your work, um, which is a very high level of exposure and vulnerability for people to have to deal with all of a sudden. So those are the things I wanted to bring up tonight and really just bring it back around to the emotions of the situation, because a lot of people I think are about to be in for a very hard time emotionally thinking they're a bad teacher or they can't do this. And it's pretty normal, but I don't know what to do about it. Sorry. And that's all I've got to say. Beautiful. In, um, I was just reading last week, there's, uh, according to YouTube statistics, they call it the 50% rule, which is basically that however long your video is, people will watch 50% of it, no matter how long or how short it is. There's a whole bunch of things around, you know, make it as short as possible. But for some reason, they still only watch the first half, you know, the average number is. So, yeah, I can imagine a lot of unpleasant analytic at least, at least we hope that it won't be kind of used against us, as you say. But yes, lots to think about. All righty. Um, Josh, you are up, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, my name's Josh uh, Velez. I am a 5 6 teacher and English learning specialist uh, in Melbourne. Um, and I'm just going to be talking about. Um, uh, alternative education, I guess, or, or education for the future. Um, I will tell you that the purpose of my, my little chat here is, I don't know if you'll learn anything from this and I don't really have any solutions, but I'm really just trying to provoke a little bit of thought. I think, you know, if we're, if we're thinking the analogy of an urban planner who creates, you know, future, future infrastructure for a growing diverse um, population, um, I think that as teachers and educators, we have to probably look into the future of how we can change education as well. Um, I'll also be taught making a lot of uh, odd analogies to appliances, which is just somehow something that came up, but that's all right. Um, I think if I, if I, I posed this question and said, if education wasn't invented, um, 
what would you, what would it look like if you had to if you had to invent education what would you do what how what would the model actually look like um and i think it's really hard as a teacher to actually um think of that because it's kind of like and my first reference to like a toaster is if i told you to reinvent a toaster you'd likely invent something that's very similar to what you see because you've seen it every single day and it's extremely hard to unthink what you already know about something that works or does a job so if i asked you to reinvent let's say a, a fan uh, and i compare i use this analogy as education as a fan an oscillating fan with three blades you know with the main focus being reading writing and numeracy um that's what i think right now education is is basically it is it's, it's a fan and the reason i bring up the fan is because in 2009 you had um dyson come up with this bladeless fan that looked so futuristic and so ridiculous that people didn't know what to think of it and you know a, there's a story about it on its own where you're saying well how would you how would you even think about re reinventing a fan because it, <laughs> It, it just has to push air towards you and you just keep thinking of the same three blades. And I think that's where education kind of is, is where we have these three blades that we're focused on and NAPLAN tests on it and everything is, is related to reading, writing and, num and numeracy, which I don't think is obviously not important. Um, but I think that if we keep thinking of it with those are the core um, blades or those are the core things, then we'll always have the same education model. And we will never know if anything else really works. And there's not really a phrase for it so much, but I know that Michael Fullen talks about pedagogical legacy where, you know, in the classroom or something, a teacher might always, what might try something new, but then eventually just go back to what they know um, or what they've always been doing. Um, and, you know, visiting some, some schools um, and some high schools and stuff like that, particularly even coming from Canada and going to Australia, I, I walked into high school, some high schools, and I felt like I was, I was still in high school like not much had changed and not not much was very different and that's not a knock to high schoolers or secondary teachers at all or anything like that but it just kind of almost like the fact of what it was but i do understand why reading writing and numeracy obviously are are the are the key indicators if there's a lot of data out that and i've actually just seen some from our eels earlier was that you know your proficiency in reading and numeracy was a direct correlation for the kind of job that you were going to get and uh those who um weren't proficient at reading uh were more likely to be in the justice department uh, I, I was watching a pod or sorry listening to a podcast the other day actually said that 50 percent of uh, inmates in america are dyslexic um so that was a that was a huge stat that i think that obviously if, if you're not proficient reader that that's a big part of it and that's part of that fan um so again I don't have an answer for what we should do, but I do think that maybe if we, um, you know, my first thoughts were, well, if we change the three blades to different things like critical and creative thinking and personal and social skills or communication skills, it might change a focus a little bit, but it's still just an improvement on the three, on the three blades. So I guess the, the biggest, the biggest real question I guess I have is what does an education system look like? That's the bladeless fan that's this revolutionary fan that 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 no one that no one could have really thought of because you keep thinking and going back to the same thing so i think i challenge people as an educator to say well you know if you were to rethink education you know try your best to try, to not think about what we already know about it what, what's been very similar for many 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 years now um and is there something that we can make or a model that we can make for the future um, maybe not five years now, but 20 years down, 30 years for a very diverse and changing population. Um, so that's the question I have. I, I do have some leads on to, I know that like John Marsden, who's an author, um, he created, he opened a school in the Northern, uh, Northern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, that's meant to be alternative. And I know there's a couple of other alternative schools going around, but I wonder if, um, it's in our best interest to start maybe funding these different models of education to start saying, well, if these ones, we don't know if they're better or not, we don't know if they work better or not, but at least if we start building that roadmap to see and, and testing that longitudinal data, we'll have an answer to see if what we're doing is right. And if there's something does need to change because undoubtedly society is changing a lot as well. And kids are feeling, uh, facing a lot of different pressures and there's a lot of different outcomes for jobs and things that they're gonna have to uh, be prepared for. So. I guess, the, again, the biggest challenge and the only question I really have for you is uh, if you if you had to reinvent education, what would it look like and, and how could we make this bladeless fan of education? Thanks. Beautiful. Nice one. I guess all right, I'm going to throw in my two cents because I'm not speaking this time around. Um, to me, it's like if we're going online learning, maybe we could rethink about um, approaching flexible work. You know, so people 
at my school, at least 50% of our staff are part-time just so they can keep up with the workload. Maybe if we, you know, one of every 10 of your classes could be online. You could line up some days to, you know, pick up the kids, do medical appointments, look after your own well-being, something like that. Uh, if this online learning proves successful, that is, of course, but we'll see how we go. Speaking of online learning, what a segue. Um, Emma, over to you if you're happy to go. I am happy to go. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Emma Intercott. I am a graduate teacher in rural Victoria. So if my internet's not good, that's why. Um, I've come on today because other than having the worst and most challenging graduate year of all time, I also want to talk about my observations of equity and technology and how sometimes it is truly impossible to bridge this digital divide that we have. So just some quick facts about my students. 70% uh, of my students at the moment come from a low SES background. Um, because I am so rural, our town is nicknamed In the Hills. So only about 70% of my students have decent internet, 30% don't. And then only 10% 10, 10 of my students don't have a device at all. They, um, and that's including mobile phones. So we are, where I am teaching, it's quite a bit old fashioned. Um, um, and whilst the government has given out all these wonderful free computers, uh, so all students will be able to access them, uh, because we are rural, we only have a part-time IT guy. So getting them set up is going to take quite a long, lot of time. So it's a pretty challenging time and a pretty, challenging situation that I'm in. Um, I just want to quickly reference some literature here. The article is called Addressing Information Literacy and the, and the Digital Divide by Hollywood et al, in which they state that the digital divide is on the biggest social challenges in modern times, despite the ever-present nature of technology. So whilst technology is all around us, it, it's not coming through in an equitable way. So when we do think of equity, it's hard to ignore that of our disadvantaged students, 68% of the students from our disadvantaged areas do not have reliable internet. That's from the Smith family. So when it comes to the implementation of remote learning, our most vulnerable students are the ones that are going to slip through the cracks. They're the students that aren't going to log on. Um, so this pretty much made me reevaluate majoring in technology, my degree, and everything that I knew about it in relation to education. So whilst it is an absolutely incredible tool that can help consolidate our information um, and it can be used with absolutely fabulous success, it is not fair for those students who can't or won't log on. So I wanted to just talk about some low-tech solutions that I've been using at the moment. Um, I've tried to run a few Zoom conferences with my students and because we just don't have reliable internet where we are, it's generally a little bit of a disaster. So it's generally very buffered, audio can't get through, kids can't hear me. Um, so what I've we've been recommended to use is for low data, um, for low, sorry, for low data is the compass is actually very, very good. It doesn't take up any bloatware. It's very, very low. However, I'm not a fan because it is it can just become rope learning. So here, do these questions. Now answer back to me. So whilst it is a good system on the whole, it's not engaging enough. So where I've come to now is that I'm really have been enjoying podcasting for my students at the moment. So if you're using an iPad, for example, or an iPhone, you can just record yourself, speak, sections of text, whatnot, and then you can email it directly to the students. And downloading an audio file takes very, very little data and you can do it on your mobile and then they can listen to it in their own time. So it allows for that flexibility as well. But perhaps what I've found most successful, and this just amazes me, for these kids who just have no internet connection at all, they are all still able to get on social media. So I have been using social media to teach at the moment. So um, I, yeah, I've really utilised the fact that they are so connected on social media. And because we will not physically be at school, a lot of students are going to struggle with missing that social connection. So I think that teaching through social media right now isn't that bad of idea because it does bring a bit of that socialness back into it. Um, students can ask questions in real time in a group chat. So I have a group chat, chat set up with all my senior students at the moment. I can get, they can get answers straight away. 
Um, they can engage in general discussion. I've actually run a lesson through social media now where I posted a discussion prompt and then they answered. And it allows for flexibility. So if a student is having connectivity issues at that time, the chat log is still there for them to come back to. Believe it or not, Facebook Messenger doesn't use much data at all. It's a very minimal data app and you can download messages with very, very minimal connection. So I've been finding that it allows great flexibility, great connection for me. Um, and it's always there. It's, it's always going to come back to it. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Thanks, team. Beautiful. Don't go too far. We've got our first actual question. We have a question. What? Um, so as you were speaking, the idea that jumped out to me was sort of the tension between meet them where they are. So let's say all the kids are on TikTok uh, and then the tension of kind of being consistent as a school and privacy and all those big things. But And then how do you choose between those two, I guess, is the challenge. But here is your question. So apart from, which yeah, is a very amusing question to me, Apart from COVID-19, what's been the hardest part of your grade year? So, I mean, you know, picking between two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really feel like COVID-19 is the big standout of my graduate year. Um, I it's, it's been a big standout, but probably the other big thing for me was moving rurally. So I am only two hours out of Melbourne, but still it is, you know, learning a new community um, and learning how to integrate within their norms. Right. Okay. So fitting into the community more so than the normal teacher stuff is what you're saying? Yeah, well, just even fitting into the school. You know, every town's different, so. Hmm. All right, beautiful. Thank you. All right, next up we've got Nicholas, who I believe has what appears to be the best internet coming to us from France. Can we see him, though? Hi. Wait, go for it. Okay. Uh, good evening. So my name is Nicolas Gaube. I am French and I teach life and earth sciences in the south of France. Uh, I'm interested in the different, in the different contrib contributions of digital technology in education, uh, teacher training and the promotion of professional practices through open badges. Um, this evening, I would like to share with you the fruit of my reflection on confinement and post confinement teaching. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it has been now four weeks since all schools have been closed in France. All the exams have already been cancelled and replaced by continuous assessment. Uh, in this context, our Minister of Education has asked us to ensure pedagogical continuity. Many teachers found themselves alone with the question, how can I ensure pedagogical continuity when you know nothing about computers? The vast majority of them have never heard about MOOCs, LMS, uh, vlogs, even among the younger generations. So when they were asked to ensure pedag pedag sorry, pedagogical continuity, they didn't think in terms of digital tools, they thought in terms of digitization. They scanned their lessons, the pages of the books they usually use, and gave lessons and exercises just as if they were in the classroom, but all to be done at home. This expression, pedagogical continuity, is a nonsense and misled them. It's impossible to have the same pedagogy when distance teaching and when teaching in the classroom. What is true is indeed the continuity of learning that must be ensured, ensured and the, the French context does not necessarily help in that matter. In France, teachers are civil servants. The country provides education for all. The intrusion of private companies in this, into the system is really frowned upon. Uh, no Google Classroom, no Microsoft Team, no canvas. Due to GDPR, privacy is a priority. In this situation, how do we deal with it? How do we set up distance learning? The state, uh, the country has provided us with a con video conferencing system called the virtual classroom. And each district already has its own digital work environment, which can be considered as an LMS, but it's not used in every school. So teachers naturally turn to digital tools they already knew, WhatsApp groups or even Facebook. Students taught their teachers to use other tools too, Discord, 
or Zoom platforms are particularly popular, even if it means serving students' personal data to private companies on a silver platter. Um, a major change in practice has been to open up the possibility to communicate online with our students and their parents. Sending and receiving emails is now an integral part of teaching, of teaching practice that was not previously the case. Uh, the less we communicated with parents, the better off we were. The need to communicate with our students, the need to have a social connection has helped to overcome our fears. So faced with this, teachers was, were forced to learn new skills. The number of visitors to the sites offering the possibility of taking online quizzes increased. Many virtual classes opened their doors to the public and the communication between teachers and students has never been stronger. Um, admittedly, when we see the mixed success of the MOOCs, we may wonder, uh, may wonder about the usefulness of this approach and this training. In Belgium, for example, teachers have been explicitly forbidden to continue their teaching. The main argument is that inequalities between pupils should not be exacerbated. However, in France, we do what we can, we improvise, we learn from our mistakes. Teachers are develop developing their digital skills and finding balance in a more serene way, far from the collective hysteria of the early days. More than digital skills, I believe that we all develop online social skills. We work on our relationships with our students and with their parents. We learn how to deal with everyday issues, misunderstandings, parents' complaints about too much homework, their fears, too, uh, of not being able to face this issue. Uh, with great humility, parents acknowledge their helplessness they know that they are not teachers and at the same time they recognize and salute our work and commitment. So uh, what will remain of these troubled times? Uh, I think that the situation has de-demonized the use of digital technology for many colleagues. A teacher of mine who has the gift of bugging any computer uh, was one of the first of my college to make a virtual classroom. Teachers will no longer be afraid to engage in digital activities. They will go beyond the simple digitization of resources. They will use digital schools in, more, in their more complex and interesting aspects. They will discover that all the resources they have created can be reinvested for years to come. Uh, I also, also think that they have understood that digital uh, can also make their lives easier, can help them lighten, that work, lighten their workload, uh, and can become a, an assistant, not only to assess students, but also help them find solutions to move towards more personal, personalizations of their student pathways. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, these practices will remain confined to this specific space-time as we are now. But um, what, uh, what will be left of those weeks spent away from each other? I think uh, teacher-students relationships are going to change. I think that teachers realize that they miss their students and that uh, humans' relations are at the heart of their jobs. Um, they reconsider their students. They become more aware of the social differences between them. They learn to communicate differently with them they realize that leaving their email address to their students is not risky. They understand that communicating with families can be done just to keep in touch, not just to inform that their child has once again misbehaved. I think that teacher-pupil pedagogical relationship will be strength strengthened as a result. Um, if I may, I would like to conclude on a slightly more personal note. For me, uh, what will remain are the meetings I had during this period, the solidarity that, that was created among teachers and the many thanks I received from the teachers I trained. I like to believe that we will keep in touch and that they will not hesitate to come my help when they need it. My view on my colleagues has changed too. 
I used to see a lot of resigned, fatalistic, depressed, and bitter people. Uh, but with this crisis, I rediscovered them. I saw teachers willing to train, evolve, and learn. This confirmed my involvement in teacher training. Uh, there is no equivalent expression in French, but yes, I have witnessed it. Teachers are indeed lifelong learners. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Beautifully done. Um, I like it. I like it. I'm going to um, throw to a question. I'm not expecting you to answer this one, Nicholas, because obviously English isn't your first language, so don't feel the need to, but I'll read it out and we'll kind of jump on it. Um, so I think this might be Sarah from Melbourne. Could you guys elaborate about safety concerns? So this might be going back to Emma's question as well. Um, I'll try and summarise. I guess Australia is kind of among the best at protecting student um, images and so forth. Student protection policies are really strict in Australia. We're probably among the world leaders in that. France are kind of world leaders in data security. So kind of if you think of how often Google or Facebook works out what you're trying to set, what you're looking at and provides ads to you by collecting all that data. In France there and Germany especially, uh, the two that I know best anyway, um, they're really strict on using things like they won't use Microsoft Word, they'll use Open Word and Open Office because those things have better um, policies and privacy. Um, I know in Queensland, EQ is um, the teachers in Queensland think that their data security is quite high, which is why most things are blocked. Uh, but I would say France is even more blocked than Queensland. Um, do you want to try and jump in there, Nick? No. No pressure if you don't want to or can't. I I haven't heard any questions, so. Okay. Um, her question is, uh, what like could you maybe summarize this the safety concerns in France about te digital technology? What are people worried about Google and Microsoft and things like that? Oh, uh, I think that as most fears, uh, we don't we fear the unknown so just in case you we don't want our data to to go away and we want to control everything and anything we can so just in case uh, i don't think anything really harmful could happen but just in case we want to protect our data and uh, our kids data uh, because they are they are kids you know so we we have this philosophy that we want to use our own tools that we create and maybe they are less efficient, but we know what we are working it with and we know that they are more secure. Just, uh, yeah, we want to, to protect everything. Um, I think that's the philosophy is interesting um, and it's, um, yeah, it's um, uh, more, um, directed to the open source world too. So yeah, that's important to us. Okay, beautiful. Stephen, Thank you for that. Can I, can I jump yeah. in for two secs? Please do. Uh, I think one of the things in Australian schools, and I'll talk about where I work, we've had quite locked down um, firewalls, all of those things, our students were using a managed service. As we've moved to a more open area where our students own their managed device, um, they've got their own admin, they've got more privileges than our teachers. What we've really seen is an impotence to improve the data literacy of our students. And we're starting to work on a building of a course for our students around what is data integrity and data security? Why do you care? where your data is because um, and what does it mean when Google take your data and what do they do with it? And I think that through when we get a higher level of data literacy and media literacy in Australia and there's groups like the ABC that are doing a lot around media literacy, I think what we'll start to see is probably governments and teams having a bit more faith in the community of educators and the community of students. But I would say at least with my students at the moment, um, we have low levels of data literacy and media literacy and it's something that we really need to work on and it's of, I know it's on my digital learning team's current sprint agenda is to provide more resources on that because they're not sitting behind our firewalls anymore, they're sitting in their home 
most homes aren't running a whitelist and a blacklist or are sitting under a an edgy list mm. server and all of those things. So whilst they're not, whilst we might not point them to social media, they're not working on a moderated internet in their house anymore. So I think part of this new area is really where we have to improve the media and data literacy of our students as part of our educational agenda. Yeah, for sure. It's become all the more important now. Yeah, good point. And, and you know, just to add to that, I, I kind of read a tweet somewhere even about all the COVID thing, which probably relates is that you, you won't know if you overreact to something, but you'll definitely know if you underreact to something. And can you imagine with, you know, with Facebook scandal with Cambridge Analytica on, on voting and stuff like that. Can you imagine like the heartbreak as teachers you'd feel as if all these programs and these digital learning things that you were trying to implement 10 years down the line is being used for things that you didn't that you didn't intend on or, or, or for things that were just for marketing or for voting or for data mining or whatever it is. And all we were trying to do is enhance our enhance the learning experience. So, uh, I mean, I hope that doesn't happen, but Mm -hmm. with, with some of the things that have come out, you, you can imagine that, you know, there's there's a data mine on, on kids and it, it'll follow them. They're undoubtedly going to keep using social media, so it'll just follow them. Um, and that's scary. It really is. Can I can I just jump in there as well, Stephen? Um, we, we've talked a lot about kids and that's important and we should, um, but we should also keep in mind the, the careers and the privacy and the, the rights to their own data of educators as well. Um, because I've spent a bit of time working with education unions and I have seen so many teachers who have done things that they thought were in the very best interest of their children and it has backfired spectacularly. Um, so, yeah, be very careful about using uh, non-approved tools within the school, regardless of how good or shiny they might be. Mm, for sure. All right, I'm hoping Michael Harrison is, Matthew Harrison rather, is around. I sure am. Beautiful. Good, good. Over to you. Good. He, oh, good. Hello, everyone. Hello. Nice to see everyone here. Um, Anthea Naylor, are you here as well? Hello. Am Anthea I on the is camera? here as well. Yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, so Anthea and I are going to present together tonight. Um, thank you for having us, for starters. Um, as Stephen introduced, I'm Matthew Harrison. I'm from the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Uh, my area is autism intervention and uh, digital intervention. Uh, Anthea, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm at Melbourne yeah. University too, and we're teaching into the um, learning intervention course, so we're training special educators. Yeah, wonderful. And I've just got the stopwatch on Anthea, so we don't go over five minutes mm. and talk all day. Um, so today we just wanted to talk, one of the questions we've been getting a lot um, and I thought tonight's a great opportunity to talk about it, is how do you support um, our kids uh, with complex needs or complex disabilities or areas of need uh, as we transition to online systems of education? And I think we've seen that a lot tonight with uh, questions around um, equity. And I've been just amazed by the focus on that tonight. It's been wonderful. Um, and we've, we've been getting lots of questions. So I thought this is a good platform for us to sort of talk about how we can use something called video modeling and how we can train up parents to be able to do this, uh, to do uh, to use video modeling as a tool for teaching. And Anthea is a bit of a video modeling guru, so I'm going to throw to you a lot tonight. Mm. Um, Anthea, can you just give us an introduction to video modeling? Like, what is video modeling? Sure. So, so video modeling, particularly video self-modeling, is where a very short video is made of the child doing something that they actually can't do yet. So you edit out all the mistakes and you only show the successes. And so particularly students with autism who are very literal learners can see this video and very quickly um, get that skill that may have taken a lot longer to acquire if they were trying to learn it live. So the video has a way of really showing exactly explicitly what needs to be done. And we've had really big success with really complex students with intellectual disability and um, autism and nonverbal students to teach them a skill by showing what is possible. So you're breaking down a skill into step-by-step -step pieces and showing them the exact steps. Um, so. Just what are some examples of use? What sort of situations have you used video modeling for? 
Yeah, sure. In my in my special education classroom, I was using this for all sorts of things, like particularly children who, um, oh, I have had success of teaching children to walk and um, speak and feed themselves. Um, I've taught children to communicate by showing these really short videos that aren't true, but they're they made to look like it's possibly true. So you're showing a, another version and really simply done on an iPad. Um, edited on an iPad and I feel like if we could teach parents how to do this at home we could make a lot of difference and parents might be able to use this to facilitate their children's learning at home as well. And I know tonight we've had people uh, particularly from special schools and special development schools asking what they can do to help train parents and how they're going to manage online instruction, online teaching and that's something that I've said is, is said Find out more about video modelling and teach parents and use that to teach their goal skills uh, as a way to be able to um, a way to be able to support our families. And I think the uh, I think something that's really important is, is your rules. Because I've heard you speak about your mm. rules in BSM. Yeah. Would you like to just uh, elaborate on yeah, that? Sure. So the first one is that you only show in the video. The, the behaviour you want. You never show what you don't want. You don't show them what you want them to stop doing. You show exactly what it should look like. The video shouldn't be more than two minutes long. Sometimes the best ones are less than one minute long. It's a very short video to show the child what is expected. Um, and you just edit out what you don't want or you get like a, a stunt double of someone's hands doing what perhaps you want them to do. This has been used for academic skills. It's been used for um, social skills training, teaching kids um, uh, how, how to play with toys in the right way. So even at home, this could be used in so many ways for parents to get uh, just behaviour management when their students are really complex at home. Yeah, and how, what role do you see the teacher having in in delivering, uh, in in supporting parents with video models? How would teachers do this? I think I think we need to show parents how to use the technology, which is really easy. Uh, it, iMovie is such a simple app to use, and then I think the teacher's role is to also help work out. Uh, you know, there's been videos made of teaching kids to do math skills or reading skills. So it's it's so broad of what could be done here. So the teacher's advice would be, where is the student at now and where do we want to take them to next? Yeah, wonderful. Um, I've got some questions from the chat. Stephen, I don't want to take away from your MC duties. Would you like to ask the questions or would you like me to no, ask them? Yeah. If you can see them, you go ahead, by all means. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so, and Anthea, I know... Uh, um, Lauren has asked about where's the best place to start with resources. I know you have a website up. Yep. Yep. So I have a website called anthianayla.com. So um, A-N-T-H-E-A-N-A-Y-L-O-R. That's a website. And I also have a Facebook group, which is called Anthea Naylor's School of Video Modelling for Children with Disability and Autism. And on there and on both those places, I have um, samples. I have Q&A of like frequently asked questions. There's some, um, there's some literature that you can read about it um, and, and just a really good overview of it. This is an evidence-based practice. This has been around for over 40 years. We just haven't had technology that was easy enough for, for everyday teachers like us to use until recently. So, so there's a website. There's a Facebook group as well. And Stephen's wondering uh, about whether, and I know this is a study you did at one school uh, a couple of years ago about using it in mainstream schools. Mm, and um, just to answer that question is, does this work for students who are in inclusive settings or what sometimes called mainstream settings? Uh, and I have used it in mainstream settings, definitely. Um, absolutely have used it in mainstream settings. And if you want to talk about your, set, your whole school uh, Yeah, absolutely. Project, so we did, we took it into a mainstream school and we used this to, to work with some behaviour um, modification and also teaching some academic skills like getting yourself organised. And it's a really simple video of a girl packing her school bag and all the steps that she needed to take to pack her school bag because she would forget everything. And this video had a complete turnaround for her. Really simple things like using scissors or writing skills. I mean... There's literally hundreds of examples that we've made and had really good success with. So this is not just a special needs thing. This is video modeling is used in elite sport. 
um, in, in terms of showing someone how to do the exact stroke in their swim, right? This is not just something that is only done in, in people with disability or intellectual disability. The interesting thing is even when the mind knows that it's a video model, it still has the effect. It's, it's about pitching it in the right place. You can't just make anybody do anything through a video. You need to pitch it in the right place. So absolutely we had success in our mainstream primary schools. And there's schools in Victoria that are using it in their high schools now to teach their school-wide positive behaviour matrix framework. So they're teaching and showing the explicit behaviours that they want students to do through videos. Yeah, wonderful. I think we're at our five minutes. Oh, uh, we're at eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Nicely done. Um, yeah, I can just totally agree. Um, about three years ago, I'd finished a degree in teaching ASD students. And I was at that time reading about teaching via YouTube and all this sort of stuff. And then I went to a SDS school and they were doing what they were calling video modeling, which I was like, oh, that's the same thing that I'm doing. Um, but just obviously in a different context. And they were using, yeah, like they were using green screens to like show students what their hands would look like from their perspective and cut out right. the distracting yeah. elements. Like it's exciting Absolutely. stuff. Yeah. We, like we had um, teaching a, a young lad to nod just for yes, using like sort of non-verbal means of communication and having your hands behind the green screen, helping them, the OT, to get them to teach them to nod. And then he starts seeing them transfer these skills and it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's very, very exciting stuff. All right, I'm going to throw to Michael Ha. Are you with us, Michael? Sorry I to am. Move. Hello. Go for it. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess tonight just want to quickly... Um, share a story that um, I spoke to a colleague with about a week and a half ago um, and a math teacher um, at my particular school and she was um, wanting to investigate a lot of the software that um, I guess was even a few of them were even um, mentioned in the in the chat just um, in this feed today um, around what which platform she should use um, when we're talking about continuous learning or student learning from home. And we're really unpacking around the pros and cons of um, using different software and asking the why, um, I guess, she was leaning towards a particular software package um, platform. And it was really interesting because, um, like, you know, when we're talking about the why um, and looking at, what this particular software package had to offer um it it was definitely one of those software that you know um if we had the monetary resource um at my particular school we would have signed up for it um straight away but i guess um you know in an interesting time that we're in right now um this particular platform and a lot of the other ones as well are being made free which for her was like yippee do let's just sign up um, you know, and to the other 15 software that are free at the moment, let's just sign up to all of them. And um, I guess I, I had to um, play the bad cop a little bit and say, hang on a sec. Um, so if we were to sign up right now and embed the, this particular software um, into a lot of your curriculum and also, um, you know, um, writing when you're writing um, a lot of your resources using this particular um, software, what's gonna happen when they start charging again? So in three months time, when COVID's over um, and this particular software is gonna charge, how how can we ever afford to pay for this, um, let alone continue using this, right? And I guess um, a message or a point that I want to sort of um, bring out tonight is just to be mindful of that when you're, um, exploring different tools to use um, during this time because I know that you know there's a lot of amazing work being done worldwide um, and people are working extremely hard but we're always I guess we're yeah we all we should always remember the why when we're embedding technology um, into our teaching and learning um, you know thinking about things that whether it actually improves student outcome um, or whether it allows um, students to spark their creativity or foster creativity skills, um, whether it potentially encourage collaboration between different teachers or between student and teachers, um, or it might just um, improve workflow. So making things simpler and buying us time um, or buying student, student time for them to um, do 
to deeper learning. So those are things that we really should be thinking about when we're embedding technology in the classroom. Um, and I guess another thing that I want to touch on um, is something that I, um, over the last few days as I've been watching a lot of webinars and being in a lot of um, different web conference call is that um, we're, a lot of schools are really recognizing right now and teachers um, are recognizing that it's the relationship that we really have to um, think about and the well-being of the entire schooling community. So whether it's the students' well-being, the parents' well-being or the teacher well-being, um, the student being isolated from their friends right now, um, from their community. So that's one area that we need to focus on in the parents' end they're being thrown into a an, situation where they almost um, have to play the pseudo um, parent, teacher, sorry, um, at home. And, you know, they're not an expert. They haven't gone through um, university degree to um, to really unpack what teaching and learning means. So um, they've been thrown in the deep end. So they need support on that. And teacher um, from a lot of the research um, is coming out from Asia um, anecdotally is that a lot of teachers are working overtime um, or they seem they feel like that they're working at least twice as much and the stress level has actually gone up exponentially since they started um, remote teaching. So that's something that we need to be mindful of as well. Um, I know that I'm getting off track a little bit, but I guess my main point was that when we're um, looking at all these technologies that's been free and while it's you know, good and all that, you know, they're being made free right now to really think about the flow and effect of what happens afterwards when um, when everything is over and whether, you know, it is something that um, the school can potentially afford and to, as um, you know, a few um, of the chat that we um, touched on earlier, whether, um, you know, you look a little bit deeper around things around student privacy um, or, um, where, or around data and where does that head on. So that's all. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, lots of things to think about. It's, yeah, as you say, in three months' time, hopefully that's how long it takes. Then we'll all be thinking about how many tech companies have our email, how many tech companies now have our credit card details, and then we'll be thinking data, privacy. And uh, all the chat we've got here is imp impressed by your video quality. So do you want to tell us your secret to crisp video on your end? <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a webcam. Um, yep. So... Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to throw next to Pete Whiting, uh, and I'll just read out the word surveillance capitalism, which will be <laughs> a topic <laughs> for another teach me. <laughs> um, um, Pete, ready when you are. That's good. I'm glad I'm following Michael now. Um, we sort of leads into it. I called mine um, jamming Econo and I'm teaching in a bit of a DIY ethos moving forward into the apocalypse. Um, so about me, I'm a chemistry teacher, but I'm also a head of um, head teacher of well-being, um, feelings. I've got like hundreds to look after, and six or so teachers I work with. Um, I live and work in semi-rural New South Wales, um, and as we do with other teach me, it's not asking about anything afterwards aside from this. I'm all about well-being equity from intersectional framework, teacher empowered student well-being in an online environment, as well as stuff like flip learning, um, UDL, gamification, and why Henry Rollins is a living god. Basically, I have opinions about stuff. So as much as there are great ed theorists out there, I've often found that the biggest influences in my practice, my teaching practice, come from the people and experiences in my life outside of the classroom. And I think if we're all a bit honest, we probably all feel the same way. So while it might not be cool to say it at the moment in an ecosystem dominated by the pseudo cerebral, you know, research ed um, or the content rich curriculum or other um, conservative neoliberal trash, I've always had a deep abiding love of punk rock. Um, and that's had probably as much an impact on my teaching as John Dewey has. There was a guy called Mike Watt from seminal punk band called the Minutemen, and he was famous for saying we jam a cono which basically meant they did everything as 
lean and mean as they could, right? Like everything was done DIY. They you know, all pile in the one van and move from place to place and look after their own stuff with their friends. They made their own posters and everything was done on a, a personal scale. I think that's actually a position that all teachers can and probably need to embrace um, as we move forward into whatever new Mad Max-like environment we're teaching in next year. Um, what I love most about punk is that it's lean and varied. Um, we cut out the unnecessary fluff and, like, education is so full of extra padding. And we're all seeing that at the moment, especially with the things that Michael was just talking about. Um, what this leads to is a really a really bullshit middle-of-the-road approach, to be honest, um, and an approach that only hurts our most vulnerable students, our students who need the most support. Um, so with that, I often think about how punk is like a good teacher. It's a bit rebellious and it's a non-conformist, right? And that's where our best teachers are. Actually, my best teacher at the moment um, that I had in school is currently in the chat right now. Hi, Leah, you're a champ. Um, so I want people to be really wary of people in middle management, or if you're in middle management like I am, don't say this yourself, that sort of line of um, a consistency of approach is really important right now. That's that's a line I've been hearing a lot. And I think all it does as we move forward is it hobbles our creativity. And to be honest, it really shows a deep lack of trust in the professional ability of the teachers to work with you. The worst thing we could do right now would be to shackle our most talented and creative teachers or team members. So my suggestion, my call to arms, is that we should get lean and get a bit DIY, right? So all sorts of companies are coming forward with a cacophony of LMSs and software um, that all aim to lock down our teaching into a separate corporate final model. Um, and what I'm concerned going to end up with educational chicken nuggets. Like it's going to look like education. It'll taste a bit like education, but it won't really, you know, it's not the good meat. Um, I don't think there is an online environment that can contain good education. Uh, I think we should stop looking for it. I think it's okay for Ed to break out and to get a bit sloppy. I think much like our, our punk rock, we need to not conform to that even though it's going to be foisted on us a little bit, we should avoid it like the plague. Um, my suggestion is that you build your own LMS, right? Now, as much as you can. I know that sounds like a scary thing to do, but it doesn't have to be this big Google Classroom monolith. It could be, for one teacher, just a simple web page. For another teacher, it could be something as easy as a hyperlink document. Um, I think the key thing we need to worry about as we get in DIY is that you're able to access it, your students are able to access it, and their parents are able to access it. It needs to be equitable and accessible. And that's the thing, right? When we go to these big corporate solutions, they're not always accessible because they've gone for the middle of the road. How can we sell this to the most people? Um, you are the expert in the room, period. Uh, you know your students. Your classroom doesn't look like someone else's classroom because it's you. It's got yourself in there. And if it does, maybe you need to have a little think about that. So what we need to be moving forward, what we need to be trying to do moving forward is to have something which is not some marginalised corporate, crap, to be honest. Um, I like the, like the great sort of Ken Bauer, I don't know if any of you know who he is, uh, said regarding closed environments and messes. I don't need someone to manage my living. I know how to do that. I'm the professional. So build your own open source environment, something that you can share with your colleagues, something your students can all access. Make sure it's equitable for your situation and then share it widely. Um, as always, I'd like to end with a quote from Henry Rollins that I think is um, applicable to where we are right now. Uh, life is short. When one beast dumps you down, summon the guts to call another. Um, if it tries to kill you straight away, then the party's just started. This is an exciting time. Um, we're being thrown around a lot educationally, and we can let that get us down, or we can rise up and 
do our own thing. Um, that's me. Peace. Beautiful. The great poet Henry Rollins, eh? <laughs> Big philosopher. <laughs> You're the only one I've heard uh, deliver his uh, lyrics as a poem. It's beautiful. Every time. Every time. He's the best. Amazing. All right. Um, let me see. No questions for you, Pete. Oh, no, maybe it's, you know, too aggressive for me for a bit later. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> nice and cerebral. Um, all right. I'll just throw it to Keith as the last one, and then um, we'll kind of promo the next Teach Meets. And, but, Keith, I think yours jumps in pretty well if um, Pete's talking creating your own LMS and you're talking teachers as learning designers. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a really lovely uh, segue. Uh, so thanks, Pete, um, for, for Henry Rollins. Uh, I went to one of his spoken word tours years ago and, and had an absolute ball. But what I want to talk about kind of builds on what you were talking about because I agree with you. I think this is an incredible opportunity um, as well as, you know, an incredible challenge that, that teachers are, from everything that I've seen, rising to meet. It's, it's incredible what they're doing. And, and I'm saying incredible a lot because I think what we have the potential to do, and I'm going to be, you know, really blue sky thinking and optimistic here and suggest that what we've got the potential to do is imagine a new future of what the teaching profession might actually look like. Um, and to do that, I think we should think about what the teaching profession at the moment looks like. So you, you probably all heard that there's, there's a greater need for, for more regulated, accountable teachers. Uh, we need to make sure that only the right people get into teaching and they need to have this certain level of qualifications and we're going to do something about it. And certainly in New South Wales, we're seeing lots and lots of um, rules about who can be a teacher and who can't be a teacher coming into practice. You're probably also hearing that teaching practices should be transparent. They should be audited. Um, you know, there needs to be things like Ofsted, the Office for the Standards in Education, uh, visiting every single school and seeing what's happening in schools uh, and making decisions about um, how teachers are teaching and how they should be teaching. Uh, the other things you might be hearing are, you know, that, that whole failing narrative, which has changed from not just, it's not just education that's failing our, our young people, and it's not just schools that are failing young people. It's got really quite personal. It's teachers are failing young people, and teachers are the problem, and they are incompetent, and they are reckless, and they don't know what they're talking about, and the only reason they got into teaching was because really they couldn't get into anything else. It was the, the fallback option. Um, and, and you're seeing, you know, um, players like Teach for Australia coming into the market, offering to revolutionise teaching by getting only the very best graduates into schools and things like that. And, of course, there's that, that long-standing, somehow, uh, you know, immortal uh, idea that, that teachers get so many benefits and privileges throughout their teaching careers. You know, I, I just don't know how many people have told me that, yeah, but you only work nine to three. Or, you know, but you get 12 weeks holidays a year. And I say, why is that that so many teachers look so perennially exhausted if that's the case? And so, you know, that, that's, that's my little spiel about everything that's wrong with teaching and the way the teaching profession is recognised, uh, recognised in, certainly in the media. Um, but on the other side, the converse to that is we are seeing an incredible upswelling of support from teachers. The average person in the street actually respects teachers, um, and e I suspect even more so now considering what they have seen teachers doing and, and the amount of work and the way that teachers have almost without missing a beat pivoted to a whole new mode of teaching well outside most of their areas of expertise um, and, and carried on doing the incredible work that teachers are doing. So... Um, I say let, let's redefine and, and let's start talking about teachers in a whole new language of professionalism. And I think one of the ways that we can do this is draw on um, some of the, the, the language from learning design or instructional design and those kinds of things, which is a little bit of a North American term. And certainly learning design um, is only recently getting a bit of uh, credibility in Australia. But I, I, I was thinking, so what kind of things do teachers do uh, that should be recognised more widely. And I came up with my little six C's framework, um, you know, of, of teachers as learning designers. So so the, this is what I think teachers do. The first thing they do is they consult. Um, they work with a range of different people uh, to create the, the, the learning environments that, that stimulate learning. Uh, teachers curate. 
They make decisions about materials and resources. And that is really important because that goes back to what Pete was saying. We're the experts. We know what learning looks like. And if we sell our souls and suddenly use nothing but Apple or nothing but Jacaranda, we have abandoned that step of professionalism. And that really worries me. Uh, we create. Teachers create learning materials. They create resources. They create activities. They create culture. Um, we commission. We often work with other groups and other stakeholders. Uh, we invite people into schools. We go out and visit schools. Um, most teachers I know, we coordinate. We endlessly coordinate. We coordinate projects, activities, we design courses and curriculum when we're given the opportunity to do, to do that. And finally, and I, I think this one, the final C is perhaps the most important, uh, is we critique. Uh, we take a lot of responsibility to reject or to pr approve materials, designs or approaches. And our decisions about those are grounded in our practice as teachers. Um, so I think it's really, really important um, that, that we use this opportunity to, to celebrate the professionalism of teachers. And then we start using this language around what teachers do to recapture uh, the, the narrative of how important we as as members of the profession of educators are to, to the, the national good. And, and let's push back against some of this teacher bashing that is going on out there. Back to you. Beautiful, Keith. I'm with you. Um, all right, let's see. Um, someone said, which you might like to jump on, Keith, um, how can we be consistent if we are redefining teaching, which may be in reference to Pete, but since you're on the same vein, how would you approach that? Consistent in what? I, I don't think we should be consistent. Consistency is overrated. Um, I, I think we need to be contextual. Uh, you know, so so the, the 30 kids that I have in my class on Monday morning are entirely different to the 30 kids that you've got in your class. Uh, and me as the professional will we'll make the decisions about how best to meet the needs of the, all of the learning for all of them in consultation with my other colleagues. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe I've missed the point there, but I don't think consistency is needed in that respect. Like, yeah. I, I'm pretty, sorry to jump in there. Yeah, for, I yeah, yeah. agree more. Like, why, why would we want consistency? Like, they would assume that what I'm doing in my classroom is the same as what another teacher is doing in theirs and another teacher is doing in theirs. Like, consistency for me just, it seems like a real dog whistle, a call from management who are scared to let, and I get it, like I understand where that comes from, like I manage people, like, but you're scared to let your professionals run off and you might have had this overall plan of this is what I'd like my school to look like or this is what I'd like my online learning to look like and people are going to mess it up and people are also going to improve upon it and I think that call for consistency, I think part of that comes from I don't want people to screw it up but there's also, I think, that subconscious part of, I don't want people to, you know, this was my baby. I don't need them to make it bigger and better than my vision. Like, that's, I worry about that a lot. Yeah, for sure. I think one of one of the main sources of consistency as well is ed tech. Like, if we're all in the same LMS, we're all filling the same shaped boxes, quite literally, and also metaphorically. Uh, and that's a big kind of in, influence on that. Uh, I'm just going to throw up uh, a couple of slides at the end to sort of bring us to a bit of a close. Um, there being no uh, big questions jumping out uh, out of context. I can see in the chat there's a lot of my uh, former and current students making jokes about Lord of the Flies, which is good to see. <laughs> Very important and topical. <laughs> um, but basically, so these are the two, two teach meets that we have lined up. Uh, I'm hoping that you can see what I'm seeing, which is that uh, we're doing one on technology called Let's Get Teched Up, and we're currently seeking both presenters and attendees. Uh, and that's Monday the 18th of May at 8 p.m. If you follow that same link as always, there's another sign up. Uh, I'll probably email details to the people that signed up to this one just so that they know it's on. Um, but if you're, you haven't seen any of that stuff, you might want to sign up for this one as well. And then this is Keith's uh, Keith's child, uh, love child, let's call it. Um, challenging teacher bashing. 
<laughs> the role of democracy in Australian schools. Do you want to talk to that, Keith, about I absolutely uh, want to talk about it. And how long have you got? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll keep this really, really short. Um, I, I, I just want to uh, host a teach meet all about um, teachers as important workers, democracy workers, teachers as democracy workers, how we contribute to the strengthening of civil society and what our important role is in public education, uh, across Australia, or, or even not in public education, in non-government education. Um, so I want to host a Teach Meet around that. And what I'm really interested in, and we've already touched on this, is some of the ways that I see teachers pushing back against some kind of really uncomfortable ideologies and demands and being active citizens, if I can use that horrible term, um, and, and, and challenging teacher bashing and uh, re, reconfiguring uh, the civil sphere. Um, and I just want to mention a big shout out to Kelly. She said everyone should get out there and join their professional associations and also your unions as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Beautiful. And Josh, do you want to throw anything in about um, your Let's Get Teched Up Teach Me that you put together? <laughs> uh, no, no. I mean, I think originally it was meant to be, um, you know, obviously an in-person thing and, and get a little bit of PD on some cool, obviously, you know, tech and robotics and things like that. But I would imagine it would shift more to uh, almost seen as what's going well in our remote learning situations with online learning at that point. I think that might be the natural, I guess, path that it's going to go to, which would, would might be pretty interesting um, to see how people are traveling and if, you know, what problems and challenges and over, what we've overcome and, and where to next, I guess. So I think that would probably be pretty cool to, to hear from that, that point of view. All right. Beautiful. Um, I, did, I did have a question for Keith though. I, I, I did. Ahead. Yeah. If, I, if that's all right. Yeah. You, we you know, just wanting your opinion and, and I, I'm not sure how, like if this would actually happen, but you know, if, if online learning or remote learning goes moderately well, do you, in your opinion, do you think that um, teachers get devalued, and, and, and it, it almost perpetuates that 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 um, perception if that well they don't even need to be in class for oh, our kids gosh. to learn. I, I wish you hadn't have asked me that because now I've got to finish this on a bummer. <laughs> because one one of the things that I've be, really been struggling with, and I am perfectly happy for people to shout me down virtually over this if I've got it wrong, um, but here in New South Wales, where schools have been kept open as much as possible uh, you know i think public schools are still open this week um the reason that they've been kept open i think is not so much because you know education is essential and vital and has to be done face to face it's because schools serve a really important childcare role and allow other people to go to work and and so that speaks to it to my mind to to the the failure of, of valuing teachers for the work that they do and instead places them as, as childcare workers. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not what we as teachers do. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see how it can get worse, Josh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. I, I always just thought that and I was just kind of thinking to myself, well, you know, and, and I know in Victoria we're, oh, we're coming up to our new inter enterprise agreement and stuff too, so I wonder what kind of ammo they started to use against us in, in that sense. So... It is def definitely some interesting times, I think, for us. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Agreed. Sure. Pete, you want to jump in? I was just going to say, like, yeah, we're already not valued. Like, it's not a I, – I actually have found from the being involved in – because, yeah, my wife is still at work at the moment being a public school teacher in New South Wales. I've, I've found that being involved in the, the PNC there, as much as – they talk a big game. I think we've been more valued in these last two weeks than we have been in a very, very long time. I think the fact that we do, I think the fact that we are not just content providers, which would be a really impoverished, rubbish way of looking at education and I'd be at the door anyway. I think the fact that they're seeing the childcare, the community building, all of those things which their children are now missing out on has actually increased, uh, not politically, not when you hear politicians and, and whatnot talk, but when I hear our community members in our school here talking, like that's lifted our, our status and like no one wants us to go back to work more than they do because, I mean, I'm single parenting some kids at the moment and 
It sucks. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. In Shuriken, it's kind of like, um, sorry to butt in, but people say, oh, it's, it's, we're more than glorified babysitters. But it's the moment across the country where everyone just realized how much they friggin' love their babysitter. <laughs> like, and really need them. So, so not we're glorified babysitters, guys, we are babysitters plus, you know, and so we're double plus good. <laughs> I, I, I think we are, but I also really think that I worked four years in a hospital school and kids didn't have to do learning. You didn't have to. If you were sick, we believed you. You were sitting in a cancer ward, you know. And what parents did when we first came into those rooms and said hi with the education service, all of those things, they're like, yeah, 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 I haven't got the brain space to deal with you right now. Education's not important. Health is. What happened was that changed. As people realised that it wasn't a one- or two-week acute journey and it was something that they were going to work on long-term, Teachers became a core critical part of the education in the system and I've got a friend teaching in Rome at the moment and school is a normaliser. School is something the kids, it is the highlight of their day at the moment and we've got a campus in China and the same has happened there. They're 11 weeks into this at our China campus and school is by far the best thing that these kids have every day and they get letters and the gratitude. So I think, like, stay positive and hold out on this because I know I saw it in hospital and I'm seeing it with colleagues overseas as well where all of a sudden what you're happy, what's happening right now is the work we do day in and day out is suddenly becoming incredibly visible. It's not sitting in four walls of a classroom. It's in everybody's houses and that's what it was like in a hospital school. You, you talk with parents all the time. So I think hold out. All right. On that note, I think let's bring it to a bit of a close. Um, congratulations to the 63 people that lasted the full however long it's been, almost an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes. Nice work. Um, we'll close it there. Thanks to all the presenters, obviously, who did an exceptional job and for being willing at such short notice of a week's time to jump on and speak with us. Um, we'll close it there. All going well. Thanks for stopping by.